thousands, hundreds of thousands of computers would get infected in a single day. We need to be celebrated for the things that we're doing that isn't a part of any attack. Things have changed, but we're still in the same place at the end of the day. Today, nothing works without electricity. That's going to be exactly the same thing with connectivity. Almost everything you buy, you plug into the electricity yep. grid, but also to the internet grid. Who says tech can't be human? What is going on, everyone? Welcome back to the show. Glad to be back again. We are doing something special this episode. This episode, we brought in someone that's been in the game for more than 30 years. And what we like to pride ourselves on at Hacker Valley is that we highlight the humans behind the technology. There's all this great research going on in the field. And our guest has been doing research for more than 30 years in cybersecurity. Our guest this episode is Miko Hiponen. And Miko is the chief research officer at WISSecure and also a TED speaker and author of the book, If It's Smart, It's Vulnerable. Miko, welcome to the show. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Ron. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Super excited to have this conversation. Obviously, you're someone that has been in the space for a really long time. You have an incredible book and you even have a law named after you. Heponin's Law. We talk about things that are hacked all the time. And even for one of our shows, which is Hacker Valley Red, we asked each one of our guests, like, could you create a system that is unhackable? And we, of course, we know the answer is no. But tell us a little bit about the origin story of Heponin's Law. Like, what brought you to that, that state to say that, hey, if it's smart, if it's connected to anything, it's vulnerable? I think I first said this phrase on some stage. I was doing a talk in some random conference somewhere around the time when, when smart devices were really becoming common in people's homes. And, and I just made the note that as we add functionality and connectivity to everyday devices, yes, they become smart, but they also become hackable. And then I said it, if it's smart, it's vulnerable. And that just stuck. People kept repeating it. Eventually, someone said that it's the Hüppen and Law, and it stuck. And then when I was working with Wiley on my book um, last year, we had tons of different title suggestions for the book until Wiley realized that, holy hell, Mikko, there's a law named after you. We should use that. And that's why the book <laughs> Is also named, if it's smart, it's vulnerable. Although the book covers a lot of other topics. It's not just about IoT security or smart devices security, but I think it's a great title because it covers a lot of the things that's happening around us right now. So it feels like you've been everywhere. Like when I was doing some research, just to kind of get a feel for like how long you've been in the industry, the type of work that you've been doing. I saw that you've done the TED Talk. You've been on many different podcasts. You presented at so many conferences how do you decide on what to focus on? Because there's a million topics in cybersecurity, but what about for you? How do you distill it down to something that you're interested in and where does that originate from? I've done a lot of different things over the years, but I guess the main theme has always been around understanding who we are fighting, researching the enemy. Mm. I, I um, strongly believe that if we don't understand who we are fighting, if we don't understand the motivations of our enemy, um, we really have no hope in fighting them at all. And I was doing this already 30 years ago. Back then it was really simple because I was trying to figure out which teenage boy wrote which virus. Back then it was just teenage boys <laughs> mm -hmm. writing viruses yeah. for fun. But nowadays, of course, it is much more complicated as we have these organized cybercrime gangs making large amounts of money with ransomware and other online crime and all of these nation state attackers as well. So that's what I'm, I'm, I've been doing in one way or another all these years, trying to understand where the enemy is coming from and then explain that to people. And I often say that nowadays, nowadays I believe my job is closer to the job of a translator. I'm, I'm translating from one language mm -hmm. to another, translating from the, the, the technology geek and nerd language to a language anybody can understand. I do a lot of 
briefings to big companies, to leadership teams, to board members, people who are not experts in cybersecurity, who are not experts in IT or technology at all. And they need to know what matters here, what's changing. And I'm, I'm doing my best to give them a broad view of where the world is right now and where we're going next. I think what's incredible about your position is that you've really gone from the very beginning of a lot of this to where we are today. I mean, you talk about the way things change. One thing that's changed is, you know, one of the stories you tell is that I think it was the Cinderella 2 uh, executable that, Mm -hmm. you know, some teenager made, but he just made it because he wanted to, you know, spread his love in some type of way around the (laughs) world. And he wanted to be connected to everyone. So you've seen this entire transition, this entire trend kind of unfold before your eyes. What are some of the most surprising things that you've seen so far? In the beginning of my career, I wouldn't even have believed that eventually every home will have a computer. Because back then, only computer programmers had computers in their homes. And the idea that every home would have a PC sounded far-fetched, because clearly not everybody's a computer programmer. Why would they have computers in their home? Much less the idea that every pocket would have a computer. Today, every pocket has not just a computer, but a supercomputer. If you look at the computing power of a modern Android or iPhone device, it's faster than the fastest supercomputer 20 years ago, which is nuts because these things run on batteries. And supercomputers 20 years ago were running on massive generators. So th- 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 this world is changing now very fast. We are sitting in the middle of biggest technology revolution in mankind's history. And we will forever be remembered as the first first people, first generations which got, got online. Mankind Walk this planet 100,000 years offline. We got online during our time, and now we will be online forever. Our generations just happen to be born during this defining time. And this internet network is going to be as defining as electricity grid. Today, nothing works without electricity. That's going to be exactly the same thing with connectivity. Even today, almost everything you buy, you plug into the electricity grid, but also to the internet grid. And as we all know, if electricity shuts down, everything shuts down, exactly the same thing eventually will be true for connectivity. It's like that moment in a good movie or any good story where the protagonist sees something he sees that big explosion and then you can never go back to their Mm -hmm. home because the world has changed when you think about just like being online and all of civilization for the most part being online what was that inciting moment in your life or your career where you saw something change with technology and you knew that you were going to fundamentally change with it in april 1994 i was 24 years old And I set up the first website I ever did, which was a website for our company. There were 17 websites in my home country of Finland before that. We were website number 18, I believe. Um, And I remember when when we had it running and we started seeing people accessing the website and clicking on links and reading texts and looking at the images, I realized that this is going to change the world because I had been using the internet before that, using email, which existed, FTP, which was already around, and some of the earlier Mm -hmm. services. Mm -hmm. But those were hard to use. And now this was something anybody could use. And I remember we had this discussion around the lab about how this new web is going to change the world. Uh, Eventually, there's going to be like, I don't know, news online, or maybe the weather report will be available on the web, or or who knows, maybe one day movies. And and of course, all of that happened. But but at the time, in 1994, the discussion then went into the direction that, hmm, I wonder why would the weather report or, or, or the news be available online? I mean, clearly, newspapers are not going to start publishing their news online unless there's a payment mechanism. Because if you want to read the news, you buy buy the newspaper. Why would you have it for free online? So we figured that there's probably going to be some kind of a payment mechanism, like a button in the browser. I would like to read this article. I click the button, micropayment, I pay two cents, one cent, half a cent, something small to read that article. That's how we figured it would work. And we were completely wrong. Instead, technology gorillas came up with this completely different way of paying for content, which is profiling every single user and then providing advertisers access to these profiles, which became then this multi-billion dollar business. It's weird. 30 years later, 
we still don't have that payment button in our browsers and now it has become the norm that we don't pay for content with money but we pay for content with our private data what, where did this interest really come from was it really that that first website and is that the website that you accidentally like deleted <laughs> yes it is the very same website i accidentally deleted maybe <laughs> Maybe in the summer of 1994, I was cleaning some old folders on our server and there was a hard link, which I didn't realize. And when I deleted a folder in another part of the directory structure, I ended up deleting our website. And of course, we didn't have a backup. Like, this is a security company. Oh. I deleted the whole website and we had no backup. I had to go to the CEO and explain what I had just done. It seemed like a big deal at the time, but of course, in hindsight, it wasn't a very big website at all. It was fairly easy to recreate. Of course, by that time, I had already been in the industry for quite a while. I, I started programming as a teenager, um, first on CPM computers, um, especially PCs made by Nokia, the Finnish gorilla of technology, which was making computers at the time. Then on Commodore 64s, I was shipping my first commercial programs, games and tools on Commodore 64 when I was 17. But then I got into security when I was 20 or 21, started analyzing early viruses. And uh, that's what I'm doing still today. And the one example I, I often refer to people is, is the fact that I still carry today an Omega watch in my hand, which I got after 10 years of service for this company. And the reason why I carry an Omega is that we had a tradition in the company that after, after 10 years of service, you get an Omega watch because the very first virus we ever analyzed and named was called Omega. And I know because I analyzed and named the virus and I named it wow. Omega because it would display Omega symbol on screen on the third th or on Friday the 13th and then it would destroy everything on the hard drive. Mm. And I know what you're thinking. I should not have named the virus Omega. I should have named it Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been nice. <laughs> You know, I, I, I've always loved research, especially cybersecurity research, because you get one step closer to understanding the, the mindset of a criminal or a teenager in some cases. Mm. Uh, but it always comes with a price. For me, that price was time because I wasn't, I wasn't the best at assembly. I wasn't the best at C or C++. So when I would spend time with any type of threat or malware, it would take a lot of time for my day and for my family. But for you, what was that trial and tribulation when you were doing research, especially early on in your career? Yeah, it, it of course takes a lot of time, especially if you're doing it by yourself. Nowadays, I'm in a lucky position that we have 1,300 people working at WitSecure and we can do this research professionally. We have shifts working around the world. There's always a lab up somewhere in the world. And when I need help with my research, I can just ask for it, which is, which is great. That wasn't the situation early on. For quite many years, all of our facilities were here in Helsinki, where I am right now, which meant that if there was an outbreak somewhere in the world in the middle of the night, our time, we were working in the middle of the night, our time. Mm. And that was sort of like exciting and, and, and kind of cool for a while. But then when you hit the threshold that it's the third time this week that you wake up at 3 a.m. to look, look at some malware, it's not very cool anymore. So, so we were a bit younger back then and it, it was really exciting to work long hours, but you can't do it for very long. And I'm happy that uh, we have a much more professional operation nowadays <laughs> and we have a very big part of our work uh, done by machines since we've been building machine learning systems and artificial engine frameworks to do a big part of our work already for a very long time. I need to jump in here for a second because our sponsor and friends at NetSpy wanted us to ask you, our listeners, a question. Have you ever wondered what's truly on your attack surface? And better yet, do you want a better understanding of your assets and what those assets are exposed to? NetSpy has created an attack surface management platform to help you make sense of it all. NetSpy also has a team of skilled pen testers that can help you with getting a better understanding of your attack surface. To learn more about NetSpy, visit netspy.com forward slash HVM and tell them Chris and Ron sent you. Thank you, NetSpy, for sponsoring this episode and making it possible. Now let's get back to the conversation. 
One thing I have to ask is one thing that we're seeing a lot in today's environment is we're seeing a lot of folks living off the land. They're, of course, using their the common vectors, email, watering hole sites, supply chain attacks. What are you seeing uh, different in malware today? From my perspective, I think malware is getting fewer and farther between. I'm sure there's more iterations on malware, but I, w- I, I would say that there is less news breaking malware than ever before. Would you agree with that or would you see it differently? Um, yes and no. Um, when we look at where malware was 10 years ago, 15 years ago, then it was the time, still the time of malware outbreaks. So self-spreading worms, self-spreading viruses or web worms or things like that, drive-by exploits on popular websites, all of that meant that thousands, hundreds of thousands of computers would get infected in a single day. Sometimes millions of computers, in the case of self-spreading automatic worms, were were possible. And of course, those were huge incidents. They were front-page news everywhere around the planet. But that's actually bad for the business of the online criminals. Like, if you're If your target is to make money with your malware, you actually don't want to be on the cover of the New York Times. You don't want your malware to be on on front page of CNN.com. It's much better for you to have a small-scale, slowly, controllably spreading Trojan, which you deploy slowly so it doesn't attract too much interest, not the interest of the media, of security companies, of the law enforcement – and, and that's the big shift. Um, when you look at the big historic outbreaks, Love Letter, Slammer, Slapper, Code Red, none of those tried to make money. And then when you look at today's attacks, uh, where money is by far the most common motive, um, that, that's the difference. But when I said yes and no, there's another difference, which is that most of the malware we used to see until eight years ago were fairly fairly invisible. So like there would be a large infection in your company and you wouldn't know because it's a keylogger. It sits on every computer, collects every password, collects every credit card number, but it's not visible. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't say anything unless you detect it somehow. You will never know. Neither will anyone else. Then you look at today, ransomware. Ransomware, you will not miss it if your organization gets mm-hmm. hit by ransomware because every single computer in your organization is sh- showing a ransom note on the screen. Much more, the the world outside of your organization will know it as well because there will be a ransom note posted on a website running in the Tor Hidden Service. So the visibility the whole world has to how big the problem is has increased because ransomware is the biggest problem and that's a very, very visible problem that's easy to quantify. Uh, so mm-hmm. the world has changed in, in many ways and that's those, those are two examples on how it has changed. I've always been curious about why have I never been reached out to by a criminal organization? I consider myself a good cybersecurity practitioner, a good hacker. I've never gotten an offer, and I'm and I'm glad about that. But if I were, I've always been curious about what would be the point of flipping. What would be that that um, that opportunity, that um, incentive that makes me say, you know what, I'm going to go against the law and I'm going to steal data or do ransom on companies. From your experience and research, what do you think are those incentives that make people justify breaking the law and also committing crimes against companies or even entire countries? Why do people break the law at all? Because they see great opportunity um, (laughs) which they couldn't otherwise reach. Um, If you want to make a lot of money, easy. Crime is is the way Mm. people typically do it applies to the real world and applies to the online world as well. But there's special things around online world. A um, big part of online criminals are people with the skills but without the opportunities. So people like you and me, people who understand technology, people who, who can code, who understand protocols, living in modern Western democratic countries, in, in big cities, living in Texas or living in Helsinki, you can find a good job for your skills. You can make a nice living for yourself legally with these skills. However, if you have the same set of skills and you're living somewhere in Siberia or somewhere in, in, in rural China or in the slums of Sao Paulo, Brazil, 
the easiest way for you to make a lot of money with those same skills is to go to the life of crime. And it's tempting because there's so many examples of these online criminals who are driving around in Lamborghinis and, and, uh, and hmm. in Rolls Royces and having a life of luxury around them. And seemingly they are never caught. Or even if they're caught, they're not taken into court. Or if they're taken into court, they're not sentenced. Or if they're sentenced, the sentences are typically slaps on the wrist. So mm. that's, I think, where we are failing the hardest as a society to make this problem smaller. If we really want to make this problem smaller, we really should emphasize on being able to catch more online criminals, get them to court, get them sentenced, and show the world that crime doesn't pay, not even online crime. Mm -hmm. I'm sure, I don't know if you believe in uh, alternate universes or anything out there, but if there is an alternate universe where Miko is a cyber criminal, what type of cyber criminal do you think he'd be? Oh, that's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's think. Mm, I wouldn't be doing anything too nasty. Um, I'd be doing something that makes a lot of money easily without hurting people who are already hurting. Um, um, with that, I mean that, mm -hmm. for example, lately we've seen a lot of um, – Data breach is affecting, for example, medical institutions, which is really unfair and, right. and, and, and mm -hmm. just requires an unusually cruel and cold attacker. I wouldn't do that. So I guess I would be specializing in advanced business email compromises, um, breaking into email structure of large companies and then rerouting money figures to steal money, hopefully so that nobody will never realize that they've lost money, maybe siphoning small amounts from multiple accounts over a long time. So, something like that. That's what I would be doing. What would you be doing? <laughs> what would I do? That's a really good question. Honestly, I, I would want to be the arms dealer. I would want to be the, either the, the collector or creator of, of weapons that were just either zero days of some sort or things that people could, could buy. I, I would do like an arms dealer type of thing. So it's all about the technology for me. Uh, what people do with it is on them. I would probably have some type of uh, certificate of uh, integrity and say, hey, do not use this to like harm children or, or innocent people or whatsoever. But who knows if uh, criminals actually follow that stuff. What about you, Ron? <laughs> <laughs> and you wouldn't be selling them to all countries either. You know, I mean, zero days are dual use technology. There's restrictions where you could sell them mm -hmm. too. Only if dangerous objects have that little label. Like you're not allowed to use this for anything malicious. Uh, for me, I would probably... For educational purposes <laughs> exactly. Only. I would probably um, do something with money, uh, not necessarily stealing it, but borrowing it. You know, there's a lot of ways to make 2%, 7%, 10% interest, depending on the economic climate. So I would probably have some fake interface that people would log into to think they're transacting with their bank. Yet it's really me that has all of their money. I'm their bank and I'm, you know, managing it for them and I just so happen to borrow it. That would be <laughs> my form of uh, cyber criminal activity. Oh boy! <laughs> but you know what? Uh, we gotta we all, we gotta also talk about um, some of the similarities that we saw when we first joined cybersecurity to today. Because I feel like mm -hmm. there's always this pattern that we start to recognize that things have changed, but we're still in the same place at the end of the day. What have you guys seen? You know, over the course of your careers that you thought was different, you know, when it came to the revolution of technology, but it's really the same same way that it's always worked in the world. Well, there's several examples I could name. One thing which I was really surprised about was when when um, Mirai, the first widespread IoT worm, was found five years ago or so. Um, Mirai is Japanese; it means the future. However, the way it was spreading was that it was scanning the public IPv4 address range to find IoT machines. Then it would try logging into these devices with Telnet using, you know, well-known usernames and passwords. And I was like looking at it, shaking my head, like, what Telnet? I mean, nobody has Telnet anymore. It's an unencrypted terminal protocol, which <laughs> nobody's running on their computers because it was replaced by SSH, which is an encrypted version of Telnet. Mm -hmm. Why on earth did we start bundling Telnet on these IoT devices 
again after already got, gotten rid of it. That's one thing which reminds me of that. Same thing with macroviruses. Macroviruses used to be the biggest problem around the year 2000, Word and Excel macroviruses, mm-hmm. which we got rid of when Microsoft by default disabled them. Users had to click a button to enable macros. Then uh, yep. attackers found various other ways like Java and Flash and whatever we had in the middle. But when everything else was closed down, then they went back to the uh, easiest way of getting in, which was, again, macros, just social engineering users to click the button. But there's pl- plenty of things which were problematic, which we fixed, and then years later, they become problems mm-hmm. again. Yeah, I would say the things that continue to repeat themselves are honestly based on our behaviors, based on our architecture uh, of how we architect our technology, of how we develop our technology, of our human behaviors, we're still clicking links. So I feel like we're going to continue to see history repeat itself because we're humans and we have almost these this seemingly finite set of behaviors that we have that are just going to continue to be exploited into the future. What do you think, Ron? Yeah. Um, for From my experience, I think there's like this piece of history that keeps coming up with keys. Like we have keys to our houses. I went to my sister's house uh, pretty recently. She had keys on her windows. She has an older home. And like we just have this obsession with the key. And in a way, we've used username and passwords. That was our key. And now we're trying to change something else to be our key. We're using Mm -hmm. things like IAM and privilege access management and saying, hey, now these are your set of keys instead of your credentials per se. But I think like this use of keys is something that we've seen in the past that we see today. And we're going to see that iteration of the key just evolve over and over again in the future. Mm, Mm -hmm. I love that. I mean, it makes so much sense, you know, as as people try to move away from passwords and and all that, we're going to continue to make mistakes. But I do hope I I am an optimist at the end of the day. I do think we're going to continue to get better. People are going to learn. People are just going to wise up. Right. Miko, one thing I wanted to ask you about is you've you've obviously had some great, great success in your career. You've shared the TED stage about three times at this point. You've been on countless podcasts. Mm-hmm. You have a book. So a lot of people know who you are outside of being a, attached to some attack or a specific piece of malware. But that's not the case for everyone in cybersecurity. Uh, for instance, we had the Difference Makers Awards with SANS last year, where we got to truly celebrate everyone, the research they're doing, the mentorship that they're executing in their day-to-day life, and just really just celebrating them as people and practitioners. But we don't get a lot of that. A lot of times, we have to wait for things like Mirai Botnet, like you were talking about. We had to wait for things like Heartbleed. We have to wait for shell shock. We have to wait for all these bad things to happen before we get put front and center mm-hmm. in front of the world. But I understand that you you feel the similar way as I do, that we need to be celebrated for the things that we're doing that isn't a part of any attack or any type of malware. What do you have to say about that? Cybersecurity is only visible when it fails. I can guarantee to you that USA Today won't have a headline tomorrow saying that the second largest company in the United States was not hacked yesterday. Because that's not news. When something (laughs) does not happen, Mm -hmm. that's not news. Then when security people fail and there is a hack, there's a data breach, there's a data leak, there's a ransomware incident, that's the news. So only failures make the news. In our profession, uh, we're only seen when we fail. And that is is problematic in many ways because there's so much more success stories than failures, but only the failures are visible. I've sometimes called this the cybersecurity Tetris because in Tetris, you're trying to clear the lines. When you make a whole line, which is what you're trying to do, the line disappears. So your disappears, your, your successes disappear, but your failures pile up. That's what's happening in cybersecurity as well. And rarely is anyone thanked for stopping a disaster which didn't happen. And that's exactly why I, whenever I have the chance, thank people for their work. Because there's so many cases where the IT security department worked through the weekend to patch a new vulnerability in the systems. And they finish early Sunday morning just to realize that you know, Monday morning, someone was scanning through their IP range looking for that vulnerability. And since they patched everything, nothing happened, which means no one, no one will ever know. Like if you do your job 
well enough, people wonder if you did anything at all. So let me use this mm-hmm. chance to thank the listeners. Thank you for your work. Thank you for making this world a safer place. Even if no one sees what you've done, it matters. That's beautiful. And, you know, to kind of piggyback on that, you know, there's a lot of people out there in the world, some early on in their career, some very mature in their career in cybersecurity that are looking for advice and wisdom from people like yourself. So if there was that one piece of advice, one piece of wisdom that you can give to our audience about becoming a better researcher, a better learner, what would that piece of advice be? I say try to find a niche and then become as good as you can in that niche. Um, And that niche can be really, really narrow. Like if you are, you know, a top class expert in some specific field, you there was all there will always be demand for your skills. So find something that you're good at, some something that you're interested in, and then go all in in that specific area. And and you know, that's going to turn out typically very well. You don't have to be the best in the world because there's already so many people who have burnt out in this field when they just, you know, try to Try to be best in everything or the best in the world. Just be the best you you can be in some narrow area, and that's going to work out well for you. You just have to make sure that the world knows you have those skills. And there's plenty of ways making yourself known. You can blog about it. You can have a public GitHub. You can be you know, doing podcasts, or you can be available on social media. And once people learn about your skills, there's always going to be demand for your skills in that area. Absolutely. You heard it here first, folks. The riches are in the niches. You heard it from Miko. Uh, Miko, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to hop on the mics with us and have a conversation about your work and your life. And honestly, the trend that is this thing called the Internet. Uh, We're going to drop all of your links so you can get to know Miko and definitely get his book. If it's smart, it's vulnerable. Uh, With that, we will see everyone next time. Thank you.